Um, Nina and I had the absolute privilege of being expert witnesses at the Tim Noakes trial back in October last year. And this is a bird's eye view of what went on at the trial. The agenda I'd like to go through is, first of all, look at the players and the kickoff. Some of them you'll know, some of them you might not. Who was the, um, or who lodged the complaint? What was the complaint all about? What charge did it lead to? The timeline, the doctor-patient relationship, because that is absolutely at the heart of this case. Was the advice unconventional? What has evidence got to do with all of this? An interesting aside, and what happens next? So we're going to rattle through that over the next half an hour. Now the players. The first player you know very well indeed. <laughs> Professor yeah. Tim Noakes. <laughs> and so many people came up to me at the drinks last night and just said, thank you for what you're doing for Tim Noakes. So he is such a loved person. So Tim is the respondent. The complainant is Claire Julsin Stridham, who's a dietitian from South Africa. And then she makes the complaint. <laughs> no sound effects needed, thank you. She makes the complaint, and then her complaint is basically taken up by the Health Professions Council of South Africa. And that's the professional body for doctors, dietitians, medical professionals in South Africa. They set the rules, they set the ethical codes, and then they judge people on those codes. Now, I had to read through about 2,000 pages of transcripts to get up to speed, to go down and be a witness at this trial. And I kept getting confused between respondent, complainant, pro forma complainant, all the rest of it. So I used a bit of imagery just to, to help me with this. Um, Star Wars, anyone familiar with Star Wars? <laughs> so... <laughs> I obviously thought about Luke Skywalker because the prof is terribly handsome and fit and all the rest of it, but in the end went for Obi-Wan Kenobi, the wise one. Now, anyone who saw Jimmy's presentation this morning, we've already had Darth Vader used in terms of Ansel Keys, but that helped me remember where the complainant came from, particularly because Darth Vader comes with stormtroopers and a dietitian comes with backup dietitians, and they all think and behave in the same way. So I just thought the stormtroopers was quite perfect. And then you have the Council of the Intergalactic something or other. And apparently, I'm, I'm not massive Star Wars um, expert by any means, but apparently this council, the thing about this council is that you never quite know where they're coming from. But I think generally on balance, they're a little bit evil. So um, <laughs> now we've got the legal team. That's how it helped me remember it anyway. This is the legal team. Now this is Ravin Ramdas. Um, who is known as Rocky Ramdas. And I've managed to get a picture with Dr. Karen Zinn as well, because that's the third witness, the only one who isn't actually in this room at the moment. And some of you may not have seen a picture of Karen. Mike Van Den Est, who is quite simply the best advocate in South Africa. And when he heard that Tim was being charged with this crazy charge, he actually approached Tim, as did Rocky, and said, we just want to act for you. Whatever it costs, if you can't afford it, whatever, we're acting for you. So yeah, round of applause for Mike and Rocky. Thank you. And this guy is just hysterical. This is Tim's lawyer. So this is Adam Pike. Adam is kind of like the coordinator. He brings in all the advocates. He runs the whole show. He is an absolute character. So that's the legal team. Now, who in the audience tweets? I tweet, yeah. Can anyone who tweets believe that this started with a tweet? Because it did, and it was the 3rd of February. 2014, so over three years have passed, and some poor woman called Pippa Leenstra, um, and we can only assume she's innocent in all of this, she threw out a tweet to Prof Noakes and Sally Ann Creed, who's the co-author of Real Meal Revolution, and she said, hey guys, is low carb high fat okay for breastfeeding mums? I'm a bit worried about, you know, the wind of the cauliflower and all the rest of it for babies. So the prof didn't spot it straight away. Bearing in mind, he's got about 80,000 followers. And he didn't spot it straight away. But then on the 5th of February, he very kindly replied, as he tries to do. What a dear man. And he said, the baby doesn't eat the dairy and the cauliflower, just the very healthy, high-fat breast milk. And these seven words that I've highlighted, if I had a buck for every time these came up in that trial, I could retire now. 
key is to wean baby onto low carb, high fat, and that became the essence of everything. Now on the 6th of February, make a note of that time there, 6.27 a.m., this is when dietitian Claire joins in. And she tweets, Professor Tim Notes, Pippa Leinstra, contact me, here's my number, here's my email address, get some evidence-based advice from me. You don't want to be listening to this chappy here. Now, this is why the time is, com is important. The complaint comes in at 8.47 a.m. on that day. So she's wasting no time whatsoever in having seen that the prof has replied to move in to put in a complaint against him. So she fires off this email, to whom it may concern. I would like to report Professor Tim notes he's given incorrect medical, medical watch. She didn't put a noun on it. On Twitter, that's not evidence-based. I've attached the tweet bit where prof notes advices. I mean, she was making errors all over the place. <laughs> a breastfeeding mother to wean her baby onto a low carbohydrate, high fat diet. I urge the HBCSA to please take urgent action against this type of misconduct. As Professor Tim notes, is a celebrity in South Africa. I mean, at this point, you think Kim Kardashian has joined in <laughs> in the Twitter feed and has started advising baby to take on low carb, high fat. I mean, it's just absurd. He's a scientist, not a celebrity. Um, makes another error. It is um, especially dangerous to give this advice. It could be life-threatening. Um, I await your response. Love and kisses, Claire. I mean, she's <laughs> falling over herself, isn't she, to, to get her complaint in. Um, didn't even check her, her note as she sent it out. And this is the charge. And this is as written. This is, is not me putting in too many witches. Um, this is just the legal language that's used by the HBCSA. That essentially he's charged with unprofessional conduct in that you acted in a manner that's not in accordance with your profession. And these are the two key bits. You provided unconventional advice on social networks, brackets tweet. So those two words became very important. What the prosecution needs to show, number one, that there is a doctor-patient relationship. Because if there isn't, the HPCSA has got no business going into this tweet. And they then have to show that unconventional advice has been provided. And particularly pediatric advice, because that's what the tweet was all about. But we got into all population dietary guidelines, which was the really fun bit. And I'll explain how they opened the door to us going into that area. The timeline. You've got the tweet on the 3rd of February. You've got the reply on the 6th of February. 20th of February 2014 was the first time that the prof was informed about the complaint. He replied on the 2nd of May, and in July, this may seem completely unrelated, but it's so related you can't believe it, a study was published by Nordia et al. in PLOS1 in July 2014, and it was about low carbohydrates and balanced diets. And it essentially concluded that the low carbohydrate diet is no better than the balanced diet. And the people behind the study were the universities of Cape Town, Stellenbosch, the MRC, the Medical Research Council, the Cochrane Collaboration, for goodness sake. This was an eminent paper, and it proved that there was no difference between the two diets. In September 2014, the HPCSA made the decision to charge the prof but they didn't tell him until the 28th of January 2015. That's when he first got notice of the charge. So we are now three years on from that little Twitter exchange. So the hearings, we had the first hearing in June 2015, the second December 2015, the third February 2016, the fourth October 2016. And I'll go through what happened to each of those. Hearing one was aborted because they couldn't follow their own guidelines. At least uh, two members of the panel should be registered under the professional body that's effectively charging the prof, and at least one of those must be in the same discipline, which for the professor is a general practitioner. So one panel member was not registered under the medical and dental profession, and the other was not of the same discipline. Now take a look at that name in the brackets there, because he was a member of the Association for the Dietitians in South Africa, which was the complainant's own organization. No bias there, I'm sure. So hearing two, we finally had a hearing that kicked off. 
23rd of November, I think this is pretty seminal date, um, so however many months after that is, the prof pleaded not guilty for the first time. I mean, the idea that an A1 rated scientist is going into an official courtroom in Cape Town pleading not guilty over a tweet is quite extraordinary. And then we had the witnesses for the prosecution. And this is when the fun really started. Because first up, we had the complainant. And that lovely looking man that you saw on slide three, Mike Van Den Est, he took on tackling the complainant. And when I was reading the transcripts before going down to South Africa, I was reading them in the office with my husband. And I kept laughing out loud. And my husband's like, what is so funny? I said, these guys, Mike and Rocky, they are so funny. And when he was cross-examining the complainant, there was one point when he says to Claire, um, she obviously doesn't want to answer his question. You'll see why in a moment. So he reminds her, Madam, the only options of reply that you have are yes, sir, no, sir, or you are talking nonsense, Mr. Cross-examiner. Um, and she didn't like that because she was going down a rabbit hole she didn't want to go down. And then she starts trying to second-guess him. And you should never second-guess Mike Van Der Nest. And so he stops her again. He says, Madam, if there is trouble in the question, rest assured, you shall see it. And boy, did she. Then we had Professor Forster. So Rocky then took over the cross-examination of Professor Forster. And before she'd even given her evidence, he destroyed her credibility as a witness. Because remember, this was about nutrition. It was about pediatrics. And it was about a tweet social media. So he kicks off by saying, Professor Vorster, are you a dietitian? No, sir, I am not. Uh, Professor Vorster, are you a pediatrician? No, sir, I am not. Do you have any pediatric nutrition experience? No, sir, I do not. Well, I've looked through your CV, Professor, and I cannot see your degree in social media. Well, no, sir, of course I do not have one. And he just left it hanging in the air. And the whole panel is then thinking, what the Frankie and Bennies is this woman doing here? <laughs> So then we had <laughs> Professor Kruger. And Professor Kruger, this was a really nice moment in the trial, because Professor Kruger came across as a really nice woman, and she didn't want to be there. She was such a reluctant witness. She actually confessed she liked the prof, she admired the prof, and she didn't think he should be in this position. So that, that was the nice bit. Then we got back to the Mr. Nasties. Um, we had Professor Danze, who was their expert on pediatrics. Now, Professor Danze, love him, he'd done a couple of studies on a couple of children somewhere back about 1942. So he wasn't exactly <laughs> leading edge. So he was fairly easy to destroy as well. And then we had Mr. Madubi, who has to have been a witness for the respondent, a witness for Tim, because he bought in this file. And apparently, when you put something on the desk in the formal part of the courtroom in South Africa, it becomes admissible into evidence. Yeah, I, maybe elsewhere, I don't know this, there's, you know, Tony Lawyer in the room or whatever. But anyway, Mr. Madobi, lovely, and he is legal services, he should know this shit. So he puts, <laughs> he puts this file on the table and Mike Van Den Est is so sharp. He's on it like the FBI on Google Mail, trust me. <laughs> he, he, he is so sharp. So they get the whole file and it became a treasure trove and it helped the prosecution so much. So we got to hearing three, went to February 2016 now, they call Professor Pinar, um, who is supposed to be an independent ethics witness. Now, Professor Pinar was more prepared to concede that there might have been three doctor-patient relationships, one with Tim, one with Claire, Cuddly Claire dietitian, and one with Marlene, somebody or other, who was another dietitian who was, who was joining in. He was more prepared to concede that all three of them had a doctor-patient relationship than he would let go the idea that the prof didn't have a doctor-patient relationship. So I don't think he did himself any favors in that. And then, thank goodness, at last, the science arrived. And the prof got on the stand February 2016. All of this is on the Notes Foundation website. You can watch, I don't know, endless hours of the prof giving evidence. And he goes through the evolution of the human diet, the diet heart hypothesis, insulin resistance, high carbohydrate diets, the obesogenic environment, infant feeding, and then finishes off with a lesson in Bradford Hill because so much of the so-called evidence in this area is epidemiological. So he thought the panel should know about uh, the Bradford Hill criteria. Um, we then came along, so we, uh, we became known as, um, as Charlie's Angels down there, or Tim's Angels, um, because there were three of us. I don't think there was anything more um, than that, and, and the idea was that we were supposed to go down and, and save the prof in some way. 
Um, and when I presented this, we had a, a Noakes Foundation fundraising event at the end of the trial. And when I presented this, I actually put our faces, the three angels, I superimposed them on, on those three. So I, I was Cameron Diaz. Um, <laughs> Because of my height, obviously. Um, actually, no, it's only because I was blonde, um, which is obviously not natural. I think Dolly Parton said once, actually, I'm not dumb and I'm not blonde, which is great. Um, Nina was Drew Barrymore um, because she's gorgeous and because she's got brown brunette bouncy curls, natural brown brunette bouncy curls. Love her. Um, and then we have Lucy Lou Karen Zinn, because she is so fit and so live. And I did superimpose our faces. And then Nina and Karen, they're very, very sensible. And they said, you know, if you do that, and people are well known in their field, it can look a little bit ridiculous. <laughs> do you want to see? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is just for Nina. That is just for Nina. I wouldn't do that. You do again. So Watch I, it, I, Zoe. I thought, she, is she, she not here? She's crying over there. She's not going to kill me. And, and also, Jeff said no politics, but apparently if you abuse everybody equally, that's okay, he said, so that's fine. So, um, I, 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 no, move on. Right, the doctor-patient relationship. Um, good luck with that one, is all I can say. Again, anybody who tweets, you've got to know you can't create a doctor-patient relationship on Twitter. And the HBCSA's own definition of a doctor-patient relationship is that the doctor must accept that the patient is the patient, and the patient must accept that the doctor is the doctor. And that didn't happen. Um, there are actually about 80 tweet replies to this original tweet. And at the end of it, Pippa says, oh, there's too much information. Go away, everyone. Leave me alone. I've talked to Claire, everyone else is joining in. Um, I don't want your advice, Prof. So she clearly stated, I'm not in any kind of relationship with you. So they're just not going to get that one, and that is so important. And then Mike Van Der Ness destroyed any further possibility of establishing that in his cross-examination of Claire Jolson Stridham. And this is how he did it. He basically said, because she had also joined in, the Prof is no more the doctor than Claire herself is actually the doctor, or any other responder. So you can't just claim one person was the doctor and not anybody else who joined in with that. There's a great thing in the HPCSA code that says you cannot steal a, a patient, you cannot supersede a patient. So if there's already a patient, you got it already, there's already a patient relationship established with the prof, then you just stole his patient, and you're in breach of the HPCSA code of conduct. <laughs> That was when she didn't want to answer the question. And the complainant held a, a consultation. She went on to hold a consultation with Pippa Leinstra. So again, if there was a prof-doctor relationship, you went way further, girl. So there's much more of a relationship with you. And those were the three killer blows. Um, I personally do not see how they can establish that, and therefore I personally do not see how they can find the prof guilty of professional misconduct. But then, as we've seen, what's happened to um, Gary Fetka and Jennifer Elliott and... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Gary's moved to the back there, and of course, Marianne's experience. Um, nothing is safe in this crazy world, but my belief is they haven't established. And that should be the end of the case. It could almost have been at the end of Claire's um, cross-examination, Tim's lawyers could actually have gone to the judge and said, Madam Joan Chair, who is absolutely awesome, there is no doctor-patient relationship, this is over, but this has been a great opportunity. So the failure to establish that relationship means that the ethical rules no longer apply. You also have to think about the possibility that if they do decide in that favour, you've got to address the unconventional advice, and that's where we went on to next. So what's the advice unconventional, just in case they do find the, the impossible? So it wasn't unconventional advice anyway, and this is why, because the paediatric guidelines in South Africa say this, and this was a gold mine when we came across it. From the six months of age, give your baby meat and chicken fish or egg every day as often as possible, dark green leafy vegetables, orange colored vegetables, fruit every day. I mean, we said that could have been out of Raising Superheroes, <laughs> which is Tim's follow-up book to The Real Mill Revolution. You know, the day that the lawyers found that was the day that, hey, you're not even gonna win the unconventional if you get to that step. And then the cross-examination, after Tim had presented all his brilliant evidence, the cross-examination 
gave us an insight into where they think they can go with this. So their cross-examination went as follows. Number one, the tweet was medical advice. No, it wasn't. You cannot give medical advice out on Twitter. Number two, you are not qualified to give paediatric advice. Well, actually, I am because I'm Obi-Wan Kenobi. But no, he didn't say that. He said, actually, I am because I'm an A1-rated scientist and my CV stretches to 74 pages and I'm a medical doctor. But it wasn't advice anyway, but don't insult me. You should have done a full consultation. Exactly. And you can't do that on Twitter. That's why there is no doctor-patient relationship on Twitter. I mean, honestly, this panel, I have no idea what Twitter is. And, and trying to go through <laughs> tweet streams and notifications, all the rest of it, they were absolutely clueless. Twitter is not the right forum for medical advice. Yes, we agree again. <laughs> you were giving dangerous medical advice to an infant. Well, if I was, then your South African dietary guidelines are in deep doo-doo because they give exactly the same advice. Key is to wean baby onto low carb high fat. This was the only thing that he could come back to. He kept trying to read something into this, like, are you trying to stop her breastfeeding? No, of course I'm not trying to stop her breastfeeding. You know, what are you trying to get her onto? Low carb high fat, you know, bulletproof coffees or whatever. I mean, for goodness <laughs> sake. But he said this so many times. At one point, Adam, the lawyer, who used to be an actor, he sat at the front of the room and he literally starts banging his head on the table like he's some Romanian orphan or something. It was tragic. I think he got told off by the chair for that drama moment. But anyway, he got away with it. Um, and then, then the only thing they would go after, you know, he had, had this 74-page CV. He's got something like 600 publications. Um, they couldn't be bothered to go through all of those and try to see if any of his findings have ever been radical or unconventional. So they basically went to his pinned tweet. And that was it. And they spent a whole afternoon on his pin tweet, which was a brilliant study that he'd done with Steve Finney. So can you imagine this poor lawyer in South Africa trying to challenge Tim on his own brilliant paper that he did with Steve Finney? But at this point, I was getting a tad worried because this is my pin tweet. <laughs> <laughs> And I said to Rocky, should I go and change mine in case they do the same thing? And he said, no, 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 nothing troubles Rocky. He said, no, 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 don't worry. He said, many a true word spoken in jest. But we'll cover that one off. So what has evidence got to do with it? Why did we get into the evidence debate? Why did we not just end it at the doctor-patient relationship? Well, this Nordea et al. review came up so many times in the people giving evidence. Like, we were waiting for it. This review was coming out. We knew that this would provide the evidence. They needed more than this tweet to be able to charge the prof. And they were waiting for this paper to come out, which is why they took so long between February 2014, this being published in July 2014, and the decision to charge him in September 2014. Now, um, any of you who've been watching the South African Medical Journal over the last few months, um, that reference at the bottom is a paper that the prof and I did on the 2nd of December. It got published in the South African Medical Journal. But because we knew it was coming in, I actually presented it in my evidence at the trial. So if you go to the Notes Foundation, again, all the blogs are up there. I think my evidence has started to go up there. And the dissection of this study is up there. So the prof called me about July of last year. And he said, you can't believe how important this study has become throughout the trial. And bear in mind, this is before I've seen the transcripts, before I've gone out there as a witness. He said, they have used this to hang me. Um, and I suddenly thought, I need somebody to dissect this. I can't trust anyone in South Africa, because all roots go back to Stellenbosch, Cape Town, Medical Research Council, Cochrane. Um, I know you like dissecting papers. Can you have a go at this one? And I dropped him a note back and said, you know, this is not robust, Tim. We're going to be able to drive a, a bus through this. We worked so fast to get this in before the submissions had to go in before the October hearing. So they actually had our dissection of this study in their pack, and they didn't read it. So the first they became aware of it was when I was called to give evidence. And one of the authors of the paper was actually in the courtroom. So she's hearing for the first time. And now, because um, Rocky leads me through my, my witness statement, so Rocky says, so now, Dr. Harkham, we're going to go through the Nordea et al. paper. And, you know, there's all sort of shock in the room. And we just assassinate it. And they haven't come back, really, with anything yet. So we worked fast. Um, it was a high stakes, because we've taken on big institutions. But uh, so far, it's looking good. But what has happened, therefore, by them bringing in this study, and it's 
opened it up beyond paediatric advice. It's become, the, the unconventional has become a debate about if our advice is evidence-based, is it unconventional? And if their advice is not evidence-based, is that the unconventional advice? And that's the fun that we've been having. So evidence versus convention has taken us into the all population dietary guidelines. It's why the prof and the angels got to do all the stuff that we did in our witness statements. And essentially the message that we've delivered to them is that the dietary guidelines are without evidence base. And not only that, but the epidemics of obesity and diabetes have coincided, gone alongside that introduction of the dietary guidelines. So the, po the question we posed is, was this coincidence, this coincidence? The interesting aside is that we wonder if the complainant has actually breached the code, because this is one of her tweets, and that is exactly as written in capitals, exclamation marks, question marks. I am horrified. How can you give advice like this? There is an HBCSA rule that says no practitioner shall cast dispersion on the reputation of another practitioner. So Mike Vandernest put this to the complainant. Um, have you cast dispersion on uh, the esteemed reputation of Professor Noakes? And he did get her to go as far as to say, maybe I overreacted. <laughs> No, really. <laughs> um, <laughs> Professor Pina, he seemed ready to accept that the complainant had breached the code. He, 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 his ethics were just so unbreachable. Um, and then this was interesting as well. Do you remember that nice one on there, Witness, the one who actually liked him and didn't really want to be there? Um, she was asked why, when she reviewed all of this, she didn't find against the complainant for having breached the code. And she said, I was only asked to investigate the prof. Interesting. So what happens next? Closing arguments, 4th and 5th of April this year. The panel deliberates 6th and 7th of April. Now, that is actually really good because apparently normally in South Africa, you can even have a year between the closing arguments and the panel getting together. Again, it's down to Joan Adams, chair, awesome. Thank you. And we will get a verdict on the 21st of April. However, this has not been without twists, this little case, because we actually got a verdict on the 28th of October, 2016. And we had a press release issued by the HPCSA. And Andy and I were actually out with the prof and his wife, Marilyn, on the Friday. The case had finished on the Wednesday. They were just starting to sleep again, to breathe, to feel that this weight was starting to come off them. Tim takes a phone call, Adam on the phone, prof, you are not going to believe this. They've just issued a press release saying that you've been found guilty of misconduct. So Adam, of course, calls the chair, who is apoplectic, because this is such an insult to her management of the whole case. Um, it was all retracted within about two hours, but of course we've got all the scream grabs, there's a potential defamation suit. Um, but incompetence, conspiracy, who knows? Again, it does make you think, even though there cannot be a doctor-patient relationship, they still could find the prof guilty, because they can do something like that. So finally, the bit I didn't tell you is what the reply was from Tim when he was asked to give a reply on May, if you remember, May 2014, he had to reply to the original complaint. And he said, I look forward to the day when the HBCSA will call for an investigation of the veracity of the evidence based on which South African dietitians are currently being trained and its effect on the obesity and diabetes epidemic that is crippling the health of this nation. Well, I put it to you, dear audience, that's exactly what he's just done. Thank you for listening. Yeah.